Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm reacting to Swami Vivekananda's Vedanta teaching, Swami Sarvapyananda. Uh, so this is going to be the Swami, uh, Swami Vivekananda train video, set of videos I'm going to go going through. Hopefully I can get enough of them from all the gurus and swamis that I have, so let's go ahead and get started. We are um, celebrating Swami Vivekananda's birthday today. Uh, it was a few days ago by the um, lunar calendar. And this is always confusing. Uh, somebody said yesterday, oh, my friend's birthday coincides with Swami Vivekananda's birthday then. I said only once this, this time, not next year. <laughs> by the English calendar, it is uh, the 12th of January. Because you calculate by the lunar cal uh, calendar, the, the tithi, the date of the birthday, keeps changing from year to year in the English calendar. Um, a gentleman who's very close to us, who works at the United Nations, he said uh, to me that yes, yes, I understand uh, the lunar calendar uh, because my wife is South Korean and she calculates her birthday by the lunar calendar. It drives me crazy because her birthday is different every day, every year. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important for us here in the Vedanta Society of New York. Swami Vivekananda established this Vedanta Society of New York in 1894. So we have this remarkable legacy. It was established, in fact, five years before uh, Belurmat itself. Swami Vivekananda did a great deal of his, uh, of his work here in New York, in the Vedanta Society of New York, in you know, the Raja Yoga, publication of the Raja Yoga, translation and publication of the Raja Yoga, um, the first edition of the Jnana Yoga, uh, the, Bhak the Karma Yoga, the uh, great author Salinger, J.D. Salinger said, these are two delightful classics, these are two classics, two little classics, Karma Yoga and Raja Yoga, which our American youth would do well to carry around in their pockets. <laughs> so these books were actually first written here and they were published from here. Uh, I think even the first edition of Bhakti Yoga also was published from, from the Vedanta Society of New York. The logo of the Ramakrishna Mission, which is very familiar, uh, it was designed here, in fact. Um, once uh, they're going to print a pamphlet. In those days, Swami Vivekananda's lectures here in New York were printed and distributed in pamphlets. And the printer, who was a devotee, he came to Swami Vivekananda one mo morning where Swami Vivekananda was at the breakfast table and said, uh, Swamiji, we need a logo to go with this. Can you design something? And on the back of an envelope, Swami Vivekananda there and then he sketched out this thing and he said, and he, then he said, the description is he tossed it across the table and he said, uh, draw it to scale and print it. So that was, that's what we use today. In fact, it's right here, I think the logo of the Ramakrishna order, and so on. So what is the subject today? What are we going to talk about um, this morning? Subject, as you saw, is very general. Swami Vivekananda's uh, teachings, Vedanta teachings. What I'm going to talk about is the old and the new in Vedanta, in Vedanta and in Vivekananda. Why this subject? It's because I've noticed that here in the West, in fact, why only West? Now in the, in the modern world, everywhere it is the same. In academia, the fashion is that um, unless you say something new, you can't make your mark. You, you get published only by claiming that what you are saying and writing is new. Nobody got it right earlier. You are the first person who's saying this for the first time. Everybody who has talked about it in this area is a fool and they all got it wrong and you are setting it right for the first time and so on. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but by not by much. Um, there's a reason why there is, this is so. In fact, I remember Professor J. N. Mahanti, who is a very well-known philosopher, master of both Indian and Western philosophy, who taught here in the United States for many decades. He said once that he had met Hannah Arendt. And Hannah Arendt, maybe here in New York itself, Hannah Arendt told him that this great difference between the ancient Greek and the ancient Indian outlook is, the ancient Greek out outlook was that something comes out of nothing. So there's always the possibility of new things coming. And the new is always new and better. Whereas uh, the ancient Indian outlook was something comes out of something. 
So whatever is coming, its roots are there. The source is behind it. The reality is behind it. It's emerging from something which was there already existing. Maybe that's the philosophy uh, why today new, uh, new publication, new idea, that is important. Um, before I go into this, just by the way, knowledge is by definition new. Even in Vedanta, one of the terms used to define knowledge is uh, prama, valid knowledge, is um, anadigata, that which has not been known earlier, is now known. So knowledge is always new, whether it's in the East or the West. But what is meant there is different from what, what we are talking about. What is meant in the Vedantic sense of knowledge being new is, for me, when I read Vedanta, when I study and when I practice spiritual disciplines, I get this new realization. But it doesn't mean it's new for, for Vedanta. It's not new for the civilization. It's not new for the Vedas. It's been there. I learn it. Just like it's new knowledge for me, only when I go to school and study the textbooks and attend the classes, that doesn't mean it's new for the professor or for uh, the discipline itself. Uh, it's it's uh, established and well known. So in that sense. Um, whereas the Indian tradition has always been, and I'm talking not about all kinds of knowledge, I'm talking about spiritual knowledge here. Uh, spiritual and maybe philosophical knowledge. The Indian tradition has been um, that uh, whatever you say uh, to be valid, it has to be based on an authentic spiritual tradition. It must be the ex expression of an established spiritual tradition. Shankaracharya goes so far as to say, Asampradayavit um, murkha, sarva shastra vidovavi murkhavad upekshaniya. That's Sanskrit for, it's polite Sanskrit for, <laughs> The person who is not learned in the tradition, who does not know the tradition, even if this person has read all the books in the library, should, this person should be disregarded as a fool, doesn't know anything. Uh, in fact, these days, it is, uh, people do not know, sometimes spiritual teachers, modern spiritual teachers, I've seen in, the, in India too, they make radical claims like, Oh, it is my realization I'm talking about. I'm not talking about somebody else's, what, whatever they said in the books. I don't read books. Uh, I am. Uh, I discovered this for myself. It is new. I'm giving you something absolutely new. And they find followers. That's why I'm saying this is a trend all over the world. That uh, the latest and the newest must be somehow the best. So um, what I'm telling you is new. It is entirely my own. They don't realize how utterly stupid how utterly they discredit themselves in the eyes of traditional learning. I remember this monk, and this is a story which I read. Um, so some, some enthusiast went and said to a monk in the Himalayas that, you know, my teacher, my guru has said these things which are not there in the Shastras, uh, uh, in the tr traditional teaching. And uh, the monk said, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate, Kahe apne guru ko gali deta hai? Why, why are you cursing, insulting your own guru? It's an insult to say that. People don't realize. Today they take it as a matter of great credit. I am absolutely original. They're absolutely stupid. <laughs> That's from the Indian perspective. So from the Indian perspective, what happens? See, both sides have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of uh, this modern approach, I would not say again a Western approach because it's all over the world now. And it's also not Western in that sense because uh, the, if you go back a couple of hundred years ago, the entire tradition in Judaism and in Christianity was a commentarial tradition. That it comes from um, down a lineage of prophets and teachers and we are commenting on it and so on. But it's a modern tradition uh, or, or a modern approach that the new must be necessarily better and it must be more authentic. Uh, maybe it's the model of progress in scientific knowledge where newer things are discovered and so the old things are dis uh, discarded. But that's not necessarily true or valid about spiritual uh, knowledge. Um, both sides have their advantages and disadvantages. What is the uh, advantage of this modern approach is that there's always the possibility of new discovery. There's always the possibility of a new and better approach. There's always the possibility of, of uh, adapting something to modern circumstances. Uh, things change, and so knowledge must change accordingly. That's the advantage. The
<clears throat> yeah, I would say like you know, obviously, a lot of the a lot of the things generally spoken, uh, generally speaking, that it's taught in the past are generally spoken in the sense that makes sense at that time frame. And now you know you, you don't say like um, I don't know, just uh, I don't know how to uh, like two coins or something like that. Just say like oh yeah, it takes two coins to do this. Like well, what, what's that in in modern times translation? You can't really do it. So a lot of it has to be. It's still the original text, but translated into modern times so that's understandable. And it's not necessarily new, but it's just a new. Well, I don't want to say new text either, but just a modern translation of the olden times that it fits more according to modern times. <clears throat> I know, I think a lot of, um, hmm, I know a lot of religious, religious texts, at least in the uh, Abrahamic religion, they, they have this, it's something interesting I found out, apparently they have a lot of books. And what to do is to determine which books to add to the Bible and what to remove, and then they publish that. Now, I don't know how much of that is true, but it's kind of interesting. And it kind of makes sense, I guess, is whatever's needed for the time, they can publish it for the stories. And then, and then you know, the, I guess the preachers out there can preach whatever's needed for the time. And obviously it has to adapt. That goes for a lot of teachings in the past, obviously. Disadvantage is that often, and I know this from personal experience, we read, you know, I, I enthusiastically read the latest articles on areas of my interest in philosophy, in Vedanta especially, Indian philosophy especially, new articles, often they are not worth the paper they are written on. <laughs> uh, only by claiming to be new, to get it published, uh, they make huge claims and then it's, when you see what is there, it's either a rehash of what is all, what was already mm -hmm. there or uh, it is uh, superficial or it is just plain wrong. Uh, in just in the eagerness to be published as something new and original, often uh, it's not worthwhile. The endeavor itself is not worthwhile. It's a waste of time. Interesting. Like, I guess, yeah, publishing saying something is new gets people interested in it. Hopefully it's just a rehashing of the old stuff, which is great. That just means it's... Um Maybe some are translated slightly differently. I mean, there's always the there's always the issue with like mistranslation or misinterpretation. But you know, um, I think that's what Swami Taratmananda has said: it's to always go back to the source. And perhaps you know, uh, getting these papers out there, hopefully people will go back to the source. All I can say is that um, what is it? Uh, if you genuinely, I mean, this could be going against what uh, Swami Taratmadana here has said, but if you genuinely read something and you interpret it to the best of your knowledge and it works for you, I mean, maybe, but I know, uh, maybe that, that is the way that it's meant to be interpreted for you. Um, but then again, this is, this is something that he says that it's, you know, you're a fool for it. <laughs> it's like you read, you read it and you misinterpret it. It's most not your intent to misinterpret it. And hopefully you don't preach it to other people, but it's more along the lines of how you interpret the teachings, how you interpret your own, uh, your yogas. Whenever you practice these yogas, you may have a different interpretation in terms of when you practice it, even if you practice it right, your experience may be different from someone else's, especially your bhakti, karma, um, and jnana, well, jnana, maybe not so much in jnana, but and especially raja, raja, and jnana perhaps are the ones that are two very similar, bhakti and, and um, karma, each, each of those devotions are very much very specific to the individual, how, I mean, they're all the same, but somewhat different. But yeah, I mean, it's um, that's kind of the weird thing whenever he talks about how, you know, um, you're a fool even if you, you haven't read all the books or anything like that, and you start interpreting it, it's like, well, you know, that's that's hum that's humanity. It's like, the second we get information about anything, we, we have a bias automatically. If, you, the, this, if the first thing that you learn, bias already. The second that you learn something, you automatically have bias. If you have no knowledge of anything, nothing at all, it's the only time you, get, you can ever claim non-bias. But at the same time, you know nothing. <laughs> you don't even know how to speak, for that matter. The second you learn how to speak, the second you learn how to identify something, bias automatically. And that's the biggest thing that we humans have to acknowledge, is the fact that we have bias. And try to understand that we have bias, so that when we get new information, 
we can separate our bias. It's not to say, oh, I don't have bias, or to say, oh, try to not think about things. No, you're, you're going to be fighting yourself, and then at a certain point, you're probably going to be thinking, it's like, is did I have bias in that one? No, acknowledge the fact that you have bias. The, the more you understand your own biases, the better you are capable of separating it. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but at least you, you're not trying to fight it, <laughs> because fighting things is just the most difficult way to do it. I'm not saying that works for everything. Again, I, I've, I've not experienced everything in the life, but as far as my knowledge goes, I think if you're able to accept certain things about you, you understand them, and you do not promote the bad ones, I think you're, you'll be better off. That's the disadvantage. The traditional approach, again, has its strengths and disadvantages. The traditional approach of, uh, there is this truth I find in the Upanishads. Now I'm commenting, writing commentaries upon it and sub-commentaries upon it and sub-sub-commentaries upon it. The great disadvantage of that approach, of course, one uh, is one can clearly see, it might simply become uncreative and unoriginal after some time, just ornamental. Oh, I was going to say, I thought he was going to say um, that if it's been translated, 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 then after so many translations, it gets lost in translation. The original meaning and what it ends up as are two different things at that point. So again, this is what uh, Swami Mananda has, has uh, said to always go back to the original and uh, or as far as close to the original as possible. That way there's not so much loss in translation uh, type of deal. Uh, it might rob us of the power of thinking, thinking orig uh, original thoughts. I remember one great pandit from whom I studied Nyaya, and I was uh, very, uh, you know, impressed to see the capacity of these traditional pandits to, m you know, memorize entire texts, and they were so well grounded in their area of study. I was talking specifically of Nyaya philosophy. Um, compared to what I saw the products of our modern school, college, university system. So I was telling this Pandit, I am so, this uh, traditional learning is, is very impressive. But that, that Pandit told me, that is true, but at the same time, uh, we lack critical thinking. So we tend to, you know, master the texts, really do it really, really well. But then to think for oneself once again about it, uh, that capacity sometimes disappears. Why I'm bringing all this up is, last year, uh, in a class at Harvard, when, Swam, uh, when um, a professor, Parimal Patil, was introducing his class on classical Indian um, Buddhist philosophy. Um, so, imagine, all the students were, there were no other Indian student except myself, and they're all graduates in philosophy, in, uh, especially trained in modern Western philosophy. So he started by saying that this distinction we are making between the traditional commentarial approach, the old text and you write commentaries and sub-commentaries and sub-commentaries upon it, and this new approach of telling, saying that I'm saying something new for the first time. Uh, and so he sort of scolded the students saying that don't be dismissive of the commentarial approach. Don't think that it's all useless because, oh, you're just writing newer and newer commentaries on this. It's the same, uh, what, old wine in new bottles? The same thing you're saying all over again. It's not worth looking at. No, no, no. Don't do that. Um, he said that this distinction between old and new is not correct. What I said till now, uh, that's Professor Patil said this is not a valid distinction. Why? Often. Why? Uh, he said that um, when you look at the, the old masters in um, Buddhist philosophy or in Vedanta, in Indian philosophy, they had their way of saying new things. So he gave an example. So if this person is writing a commentary on, a, on another master who lived centuries ago who wrote a commentary on the Buddha's teachings. And now he wants to disagree with this master. So what does he say? Um, the great Sankhapa, in all his omniscient wisdom, has come up with this out of his creative genius, meaning thereby, he's not saying anything good. He's saying that he invented it. It's not something that the Buddha said. Uh, now I want to give you this new idea. So he is saying something new. He is being critical and he is making a change. It's just that the format is of a, of a sub-commentary on another commentary. On the other hand, he said, look at um, uh, Western thinkers, Western philosophers who claim originality. But if you look deeply, they are always, all the time, even by criticizing their predecessors, they are building on their predecessors. Yeah. 
if you um, look at Sartre or Heidegger, you will find behind them Nietzsche. If you look at Nietzsche, you will find behind Nietzsche is uh, Hegel and Schopenhauer and behind that is Kant. And uh, behind that are the scholastics of, uh, you know, the Catholic theologians and behind that are the um, Greek philosophers. It, it is presented as if entirely new, but it is built upon the, like, the shoulders of giants. So that is also a kind of commentary. Fine. All this was by the way of introduction. <laughs> So what we will do now is bring this to bear upon Swami Vivekananda's presentation of Vedanta, the old and the new. What is old, what is new in uh, Swami Vivekananda's presentation of Vedanta. Swami Vivekananda himself said that my mission in life can be put in a few words. It is to preach unto humanity, their inner divinity, and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. Look at the words. To preach unto uh, humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. Every word is important. Another place, very well known definition of religion. Each soul is potentially divine. And the goal is to manifest this divinity already within us. And then you do it by, you know, by work or worship or uh, philosophy or devotion. One or more or all of these and be free. That is the whole of religion. Uh, books, temples, doctrines, churches are secondary details and so on. But notice the words, the key words are the manifestation of the divinity already within us. So this is the first thing which Swami Vivekananda says, that there is a divinity within us. This is how he presents Vedanta. What is he saying here? In traditional Advaita Vedanta, which we have studied, an inquiry into ourselves, the claim is that we are one with the absolute reality, the ultimate reality of the universe. There is an ultimate reality. And that ultimate reality is you, Tattva Masi. That is the traditional formulation. In the Upanishads you find that thou art. Now if I am that ultimate reality, my first reaction is that I don't know about it. And then we all know, we have talked about it for, you know, forever. This <laughs> That has been the theme of um, not only my talks here, but the whole Vedanta society for the last 126, 27 years. We've been talking about this divinity within ourselves. It is, you have to engage in a process of inquiry. And what I know about myself, uh, we start off by, yes, obviously there's this body and then uh, not just the body, uh, we, um, the, the mind is there, the personality. And Vedanta teaches us in various ways to inquire within ourselves. Inquire means to take a look. They will give us the instructions, the Upanishads and the Vedanta texts. Tell us how to do it. You listen to that and carefully track it. Follow it in our own experience. When you attend to our own experience, there's a philosophical fancy word for it. It's called a phenomenological approach. Phenomenological approach means how reality appears to us right now. You just attend to that. Quite distinct from believing in something later, uh, after death somewhere, or somewhere else like heaven. That's a different kind of approach. That's a dualistic devotional faith-based approach. There is also a mystical approach, when you sit and meditate and you get extraordinary experiences. But the way of Advaita Vedanta was to attend to experience right now. What experience? We have talked about it. Drik Drishya, the experience of subject and object. I am the experiencer and here is the world of experience. And you follow this and go inwards. And the, I am the seer and what I see is an object. So I look at the world, that's an object. Look at the body, that's an object. Look at the mind itself, is an object. These are now amazing new revelations to us because we always thought, I am the mind. <coughs> I am the mind in a body, that's it. We never e examine that. But then the mind itself is an object or a series of subtle objects. Yeah. And so in Vaidrik Drishya Viveka, we come to this idea that there is an awareness at my core, core of my existence is an awareness. That awareness is my real nature, but uh, we can just say that my, my deeper nature is that awareness. It's easier to grasp than immediately to abandon that I'm not the body, not the mind, I'm that awareness, that's a little difficult. But let's say I am, I, I first of all discover that such an awareness is there. It has always been there. The same thing you discover in Taittiriya Upanishad by the traditional method of the five sheets, the five layers of the human personality. Here is the physical layer, the Annamaya Kosha. And we notice inside that there is a layer of 
prana of life prana maya kosha you notice then there is a layer of thoughts deeper more subtle inwards inwards to the body is the life processes inwards to the life processes is the layer of thoughts emotions memories which we identified with ourselves but we see they are also objects just like this body is an object those thoughts are also objects subject to continuous change look inwards you find the layer of um, uh, the sheath of intellect which we are using right now to understand all these things that's also something it's also a subtle thing push inwards further inwards and the upanishad says there is the anandamaya kosha the bliss the bliss sheath which is a clue which we get in deep sleep for example and as a as the knower the observer the illuminer the experiencer of these five sheets and through these five sheets we experience the world is it same awareness which i talked about same thing we find in the mandukya upanishad just attend to your experience of waking dreaming deep sleep and notice that when we go from waking to dreaming to deep sleep huge changes there the whole world goes away and there's a world of dreams that goes away there is blankness not only the world even more stunning my physical body goes away you see in the other methods drik drishya viveka or panchakosha viveka the body is a constant it's still there but when you look at our waking dreaming and deep sleep i continue as a knowing subject as an experiencer and i lose experience of my physical body what a remarkable thing that it is there on the on the bed something that i hold on to so closely in a moment it's gone entirely from my consciousness if you say that i become unconscious i have no experience and therefore i do not experience the body that is something i can accept that but imagine the remarkable nature of dreams where i continue as an experiencer as a knowing subject and yet i have no idea of my body no experience of my body lying on the bed so that the world disappears before my eyes the body disappears before my uh, experience and then it is replaced by dreams that also disappears my whole way of looking at the world as i am a subject and i know an object this world or the <coughs> world of dreams this whole subject object thing also disappears in in deep sleep <clears throat> that's interesting actually that he pointed out and i was thinking about it the fact that it's kind of it's, it's very interesting um that when you're dreaming you do not experience the body but you experience the dream i don't know why i never thought about it that i never thought about that why are you hyper why are you super you're aware obviously because you're aware of your dreams but you're not aware of the body that is interesting again it's perhaps um kind of curious because uh you whenever you go to sleep your your brain sends out a chemical that kind of that kind of paralyzes you <laughs> that paralyzes you so that you don't act out your dreams in your um in your sleep so i'm wondering if that num i i, I, I don't know what it does necessarily uh, as far as i heard it, was, it paralyzes you basically that's why you get people who have uh forgot what they call it but basically they beca- they they're just sleeping in their bed but they're up they're awake their eyes are open but they can't move their body whatsoever and then they have but the thing is that they have the vivid nightmares where their eyes are open and they're in a sense hallucinating i think uh, again i'm i'm not familiar with the the scientific term for it or what it's called but they're they're awake and then they see like creatures with their eyes open not dreaming but they're these creatures exist <laughs> exist in their world as nightmares while their eyes are open in their bed and they can't move <clears throat> that's got to be extremely terrifying but yeah so basically your brain somehow puts your body or or, or negates the chemicals that are being sent by your body to your awareness or something like that because again you're not aware of the body like he just said and the fact that um 
the fact that even um, like people who, again, like I was just talking about, who are sleeping and their eyes are open, but they can't move their body. They're aware. They're aware that they're in their body, but can't move it. The brain sent out that chemical to uh, disable the body. That is that is that is super interesting. Because you didn't do it, <laughs> you didn't say, "Hey, let me put myself in. Uh, let me let me um let me uh disable my body real quick." No, <clears throat> your brain just does that. I mean, it makes sense as defensive mechanisms. So you don't roll off the bed and don't kick the wall and stuff. But it's very interesting. You didn't consciously do that. That's something instinctual that your body does, that your brain does to your body. Hmm. Again, something I, I, I did not think about it that way. About how you're super aware of the dreams, but you're not aware of your body. How can you how can you be aware of one and not the other? Because your brain numbs your I don't know if it's numb per se, but it's it basically numbs your body or prevents you from um <clears throat> feeling your body, I suppose. And again, I go back to the example of those people who wake up fully conscious, fully awake, and cannot move their body. And I come back again. By this method, I discover the same awareness, the same awareness which is experiencing all of this. This awareness is free of the world, is free of the body, is free of the thoughts, feelings, memories, emotions, personality. This immortal awareness. Problems are in the world. Problems are in body. Problems are in emotions, in mind, in intellect also. There are problems. And the seed of all problems, seed of all dukkha, is in the anandamaya, in the, in the causal state, deep sleep, because it comes back again. But the consciousness which transcends all of them, there is no problem there. Death is of the body, death is not of the consciousness. This immortal, problem-free consciousness, this consciousness in itself, what does it want? Suppose you try something like this right now, that imagine, the world outside has disappeared. It's all covered with snow and <laughs> buried, <laughs> gone. And then close your eyes and you see the room also disappears. There's nobody else around. And then you think that the body itself has disappeared. No physical body. Just a mass of thoughts. No perceptions. You don't see anything, hear, smell, taste, touch, anything. Now imagine all memories have disappeared. No memories. Now imagine all thoughts, ideas, disappeared and you are aware you will be aware of what? it will be like nothing now drop that nothing also suppose and just awareness the light of awareness which is always there that awareness what does it want? that is something I cannot understand the fact that obviously I can understand dropping thoughts emotion you know everything upset and just experience nothingness but how do you drop nothingness when there's nothing there to drop? Could, shouldn't it not always just be awareness at that point? Once there's nothing, there's only awareness left. So there's nothing to drop. <laughs> nothingness, there's not nothing to drop once you drop everything else. That's the thing I don't quite understand. How do you drop nothingness? You can't. There's nothing. Maybe it's the blankness. But even then, blankness is nothingness in my in my book. <clears throat> what does it need? What demands does it have? Nothing. It's perfectly fulfilled. It's always there. All problems and all demands and desires and lack of fulfillment, they come when the mind starts working. And then the, when the mind attends to itself and then to the body and to the world, then these things start up. Now that consciousness in itself, ever free, immortal, um, ever uh, pure, in purity and purity they come with the body-mind, ever satisfied, ever beyond sorrow. This is called the divinity of the soul. This is what Swami Vivekananda means. He used the word, the divinity within us. So we already have it. And the whole point is to discover this. Uh, reality. Not only this thing, the second big thing which Swami Vivekananda uh, taught about Vedanta was how many such divinities are there? 
our first reaction would be that all right so i am such an awareness and there are many such awarenesses plurality of awarenesses in all living beings in each body mind there will be one such awareness that would be the sankhyan point of view but <coughs> swami vivekananda talked about the oneness of all existence it is one awareness in the bhagavad gita vedanta says in bhagavad gita krishna says kshetragyam chaapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata uh, know me alone to be the one awareness in all beings now look god is saying that this awareness which you we discover within yourself it is the same awareness in all beings and this one awareness in all beings in and through all beings shining in in, in and through all minds is is god so this is also the other question that i have how is this proven that i can i can understand that we each have awareness i can understand we have pure awareness but <clears throat> to say that all of our awareness are the same just because we experience the same that we have the same experience doesn't necessarily mean that all our consciousness is the same and i'm trying to think of an example um I guess you could say protons or electrons. Just say electrons. <clears throat> they're all electrons, but they're all not from the they're not all this one electron. They're all individual electrons, I guess you could say. All electrons are the same, all negative negatively charged, but all different individual electrons. So and the way I'm trying to compare that to is the fact that we all can experience the same blankness, same awareness but they're all separate individual awareness they're not one big electron or one big awareness and that's another thing that I, I'm, I, I'm struggling to understand is how do we know it's one awareness that's shining through all of us instead of maybe perhaps all of us have an awareness that is exactly the same thing it's just that we each all have our own individual awareness even though we experience it the same way we have the blankness we have the eternal bliss we have uh, you know it's unaffected by the the uh transactional reality or objective reality i can i can accept all of that but the the thing that i'm struggling with is the fact that how is it all how do we know um it's all the same awareness just because it's experienced the same doesn't necessarily mean it is the same the only thing i can think of to prove to me that this is all the same awareness perhaps i mean it's still it's just very difficult it's the fact that if we can jump into each other's minds uh into each other's awareness i suppose or minds actually yeah because this would indicate that my awareness can go into your mind or to anyone's mind for that matter and then um and then you i guess come right back to my own uh, my own mind and that's one way of pro uh, proving it and i don't know if it's the definitive way because I'm not exactly sure what would be different, but it, that'd be one good way of doing it. So, a question out there, how, is there something out there that says, oh yeah, this is the proof that I accept it to be true that makes me say that we all have one awareness. For me, this is the reason why I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the middle between, you know, the materialistic world, Advaita Vedanta, I'm in the middle somewhere where I believe in a lot of things Advaita Vedanta, but the the fact that the one awareness is the one where I'm struggling at is the reason why I'm still kind of in the middle between the two. I do believe that our awareness is in our mind, and I have different ways of thinking about that. But I'm not going to go into that. I've said it a few times before, but I don't know if it's been clear. But I have my awareness. I am very much aware of my own awareness in in the in the degree. <laughs> um, but it's my awareness. It's me. My awareness. Just it's me, my awareness, whatever you want to call it. But I'm not aware of your awareness. So if, yeah, I guess we can put it that way. I, I just, I guess that's the reason why I think I struggle with the one awareness. Hopefully that makes sense. And it is one. One of the hymns by which we had, when we sing to Sri Ramakrishna, Buddhes cha sakshi nikhilasya janto. Nachayasya Veta, Yoveti Sarvam. The witness of the mind, the witness of the intellect. Where? In all living beings. Who knows all whom nobody knows. 
that we salute as sri ramakrishna but what is that sri ramakrishna it is you your own inner reality and there the entire universe is one and the external physical world and the so many bodies they are all like waves in an ocean they are all appearances in one reality this is what swami vivekananda calls the oneness of all existence he is vedanta which he taught with a lion's roar here in the west and in india is this two is built on two planks one is the divinity within us and the second one is the oneness of all existence the divinity which within each one of us already there already perfect waiting to be discovered or as he said manifested and the oneness of all existence this is vedanta according to swami vivekananda just one little uh, in observation here so this reality i am brahman discovering this so this is what is vedanta this is traditional vedanta swami vivekananda adds a little wrinkle on this a little ornamentation a little little change in this he does not say knowing the divinity within yourself he says manifesting the divinity within yourself my ideal is to preach unto humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of their life in every movement of life how to make it manifest that means in our thinking in our speaking and in our daily activities see this is where you can see the clear connection sri ramakrishna and swami vivekananda sri ramakrishna whenever he practiced any kind of spirituality he would bring it down practice it to the most basic bodily level also renunciation of wealth he threw coins into the river <laughs> this clay and coins taka mati mati taka so some jokester said oh he knew how valuable property is going to be that's why he said <laughs> clay is money money is clay <laughs> he knew that land is going to be valuable <laughs> no so he practiced it when he wanted to erase every consciousness of caste superiority um or any kind of superiority over others he went and wiped the the latrine uh, of a sweeper physically he did it wiping it with his long matted hair now this is what swami vivekananda means by the manifestation of divinity the manifestation of divinity does not only include realizing oh i am not the body not the mind chidananda roopa shiva hum i am pure consciousness i am the nature of shiva that's one part of it the other part of it is fearlessness love for everybody unselfishness you know unconditional love unselfishness um discipline self control natural self control uh, all of the qualities of a saint they should come into our lives that is the manifestation of the divinity this is the full meaning of the word manifestation i always thought why did swami vivekananda use the word manifestation of the divinity already within us why not knowledge of the divinity already within us so it must be expressed it must bear fruit in our lives above all swami vivekananda was a practical spiritualist he was a practical vedantist it must have practical benefits right now in our lives i must be able to solve my problems and the problems of others he said otherwise he said i have no interest in such a religion you know he which cannot wipe the widow's tears in this life and promises heaven after death I cannot give a loaf of bread to the hungry now and promises heaven after death i do not believe in such a religion so i very kind very strong why manifestation the na- nature of enlightenment okay we're going to say that for the next one at 30 minutes so hmm. I'm trying to think of what i was thinking a little bit earlier again about the only comparison i can i can compare to is electrons all electrons are like they're all negatively charged i believe they're all the same size they're all the same everything weight etc everything's the same about it but all electrons are individuals and that's that's the best way i can kind of compare it to say consciousness where we all our consciousness experience the same um you know it's the same blankness it's um it's the kind of the same very similar but that doesn't mean that we all come from the same consciousness that doesn't mean all electrons are one electron it's it's multiple electrons individuals consciousness doesn't necessarily mean that we all come from one consciousness 
but then from we have our own individual consciousness. I mean, I think Advaita Vedanta kind of acknowledges that that we have our own little bubble of consciousness from the big bubble, but more along the lines that we have our own individual uh, bubbles of consciousness that doesn't come from a big bubble. We have our own, and that's it. And I was trying to think on along the lines of um, even if I were to say that there is this one big consciousness. Uh, a video over with, by the way, and me talking now for just a few minutes. Um, even if there is this big consciousness that illuminates everyone, then then I, I wonder if I can say that we are the body then at that point. We are the mind. Because all, perhaps, what all this one consciousness does is... perhaps power the body? I don't know. I have to think about that one a little bit. But anyways, uh, more to the point of how do we know that this is just merely one consciousness that we're all grabbing little bits off. We don't have our own individual consciousness. We're just we're all part of the big consciousness thinking we have the uh, we have our own consciousness you know what what's the proof of that or who said that and why th do they think like that again if if it goes back to because we all experience it the same way when we get into this meditative state when we experience the blackness it's all the same the only the only thing i can give a great example for that again is the electrons all electrons are the same uh they're all, they're all negatively charged. I think they're all the way the same. But that doesn't mean that all electrons are coming from one electron. No, every electron is in an individual electron. And don't say that, oh, it's one electron and we're all pulling from the, uh, that electron. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, the whole point is the fact that, you know, how do we know that it's one consciousness instead of the fact that we all may experience meditative state, blankness the same, but it could still be the fact that we have our own individual consciousness. Just because we experience things the same doesn't necessarily mean it's the same. Uh, same consciousness. Let me know. That's the that's where I'm kind of stuck at. I've been stuck at that point for the longest time. Um, but yeah. Anyways, that's the end of part one of this video. It'll be more than likely a three-parter. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.